Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Kaiser, founder of KaiserResearch.com. He's on the line from San Francisco. John, welcome back to This Week in Money. Jim, it's a pleasure to be back. Well, you get to see us in Vancouver this Sunday and Monday. You're going to be talking at a conference. Can you tell us about it? Well, this is the uh, Vancouver Resource Investment Conference uh, running uh, uh, Sunday and Monday at the uh, convention center downtown. Uh, there's about 110, 20 companies exhibiting. That's a fairly small number. But what's interesting is a third of these companies are members of my just-released Kaiser Bottomfish 2016 edition. Uh, it's really boiling down to the hardcore survivors. I think this conference is going to be very interested for those people who still have the courage to look at resource juniors. Is that a kind of a disappointing or desperate place right now? Well, everybody is feels like we are in a state of siege. Uh, the continued meltdown in the commodity markets, uh, oil was below $30 uh, last couple of days. It's, it's devastating for Canada's economy. Big mining companies such as Tech Resources are down 90% from their peaks, uh, 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 you know, four or five years ago. Those types of declines are normally associated with juniors, which uh, have a shot at something and then fail, and then they go way down. To have real mining companies go down so dramatically, that is shocking. And that, of course, uh, has people who are involved in the junior exploration and development business sort of wondering, wow, if the big guys are getting creamed like this, what chance do we little guys have? There's an upcoming town hall meeting in Vancouver put together by the TSX Venture Exchange to discuss their white paper. Now, you've posted a blog on KaiserResearch.com cheat sheet for revitalizing the TSXV. Are the TSX Venture Town Halls a good step in growing the ongoing discussion on Canada's junior markets? Yes, I mean, the crisis is severe. Most people have had their heads in the sand about the this problem, which uh, I've been sounding the alarm about since early 2013, these town hall meetings are an opportunity for people from all walks of life, uh, uh, stakeholders, whether they be uh, uh, in the in the in the junior company business themselves or in the support sector, like accountants and uh, and, and 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 lawyers and uh, at, um, investor relations and so on, and even in the mining and exploration industry, to come down and find out why is our junior venture capital market in such sad shape? And are some of these concerns being uh, uh, voiced by people such as myself? Are they correct that we are perhaps seeing the extinction of an ecosystem that has uh, made Canada a, a foremost uh, force in uh, exploration in the world for the past 100 years? So I think, yes, this is a good thing to have because it becomes a public forum to start a dialogue, hopefully not to put an end to the dialogue. Will these discussions shine a brighter light on the imminent need for regulatory change and how regulations are killing Canada's junior markets? The the, the, the TSX Venture Exchange came up with a, a series of action proposals. Uh, what, one of them is to reduce the... Uh, regulatory costs to the junior. Another is to enhance the liquidity of the market and and, and make uh, expand the finance, the investor financing base for these companies. And the third is to diversify the exchange venture capital market away from its dependence on the energy and resource sector because it is now clear that the phrase, it is just cyclical, well, yes, it is just cyclical, but the duration of this bear cycle following a 10, 15-year super cycle could be a very long time. So these individual steps are interesting because the exchange has targeted a number of sort of small baby step changes that it can make. And when you look hard at them, and this is what I have done in my blog, these things become stepping stones for talking about bigger changes that are needed uh, across the board. Fingers continue to be pointed at the banks for controlling the regulators, yet the banks are the ones who own the TXX and the venture exchanges, and they're still allowing these town hall meetings to take place. Do you think the banks are now interested in having an open and ongoing discussion with Canada's junior market participants? Uh, I'm inclined to be cynical that the banks are interested in these town halls. Uh, 
this could be just a sop thrown to the complainers about the problem. Uh, the basic issue is that uh, venture capital companies are a problem for the bank's model of asset management and, you know, parking uh, uh, investors in structured products, which are mutual funds and ETFs, which generally are not made of high-risk individual companies. Uh, the future I see is one where individuals who are interested in high-risk, high-reward uh, investments such as, uh, you know, TSX venture listings, they will end up opening a 100% responsibility account with a discount broker, which could be an arm of one of the big financial establishments, but they will never deal with a human being in terms of advice. They will do their transactions at a very low commission. It'll, they'll take 100% responsibility, so when the when something goes wrong, they have only themselves to blame. Uh, this is the direction that the venture capital markets have to go, and it really has nothing to do with the banks. So I cannot see them as caring whether or not Canada's venture capital market survives. Well, I mean, I've heard the banks really want to have robot investing advisors for you instead of having real people. Yeah, there's a plus and minus to that. Real people are the source of, uh, you know, rogue transactions where uh, an individual uh, may gives bad advice to uh, a client and might have a personal conflict of interest in some form or another. Uh, a, a robotically managed uh, account will never have any conflict of interest except one that's very deep and hidden and orchestrated far in the bowels of the uh, of, of the bank itself. Um, the other problem with the robo-advisories is these are being created by new entities outside the establishment banks. And they are doing the same sort of asset management that the banks are doing for 1% to 2% fees, and they're doing it at 0.1% to 0.2%. So it's only natural that the big banks themselves will either acquire these new robo-advisories or develop their own robo-advisory accounts and this means that the future of the personal investment advisor, it, it is, it is doomed. There is no role for human beings except perhaps as an account schmoozer where you have a salaried individual call up the client and, uh, take them out to a golf game or, or maybe a dinner, make sure their profile is updated. People, high net worth individuals are now creating what are called family offices. This is where the sophisticated financial advisor will end up working directly for a family which has an internal research department that makes their own decisions, and they themselves will use discount brokers to do their transactions. So I think the banks may have a problem in terms of their revenue model uh, with this robo-advisory future that's coming. Have the junior markets controlled by the banks deliberately tried to eliminate independent brokers? Uh, one can say, I, I would say it's half, half the truth is that the bigger banks are predatory and have adopted a strategy of marginalizing the independent brokers. But I think the other half, perhaps a bigger problem, is a growing litigation culture, which is really created by the regulatory establishment, the government employees working in cahoots with the legal profession to create a litigation minefield for the banks themselves. And and, and this it, it is trying it is the banks trying to protect themselves from endless lawsuits uh, from clients trying to recover losses that they have result uh, uh, suffered as a result of being in this investment or that investment which is forcing the banks to create these uh, client relationship models and suitability requirements to kind of create a, a blockade against the risk of this litigation coming from losses being suffered by the uh, individuals. And the biggest source of losses, of course, are when individuals own an individual stock that implodes. And venture capital stocks, by nature, will eventually implode because it is only a minority that succeeds. So they really do have a hate on for the, 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 the juniors because they know that if uh, one of their accounts has one of these stocks in it and it goes wrong, some lawyer will figure out a reason to sue the uh, bank and try and get that money back for the client. 
Are IROC's client relationship model and suitability standards by design or accident responsible for pushing brokers and investors out of Canada's junior markets? It is pushing investors out, at least in terms of buying a high-risk, high-reward stocks. Uh, one of the uh, ideas in the suitability requirement is that if you are 55 and older, your uh, financial needs in this age of uh, unprecedented longevity uh, has to be very carefully managed, and exposing yourself to high-risk stocks is really an unsuitable investment strategy. So we hear stories of uh, brokers being forced to refuse unsolicited orders from clients that are, say, in their 60s or 70s. They've heard of this wonderful little junior company. They want to buy, and they say, no, this is unsuitable for you based on the profile that you have submitted to us. And, uh, and of course, uh, because the suitability applies across the board, an independent broker that specializes in these type of high-risk, high-reward stocks is exposed to the risk that if the client is put into that, some lawyer, that client, when the investment goes wrong, will find the lawyer and they will go after the broker. And so the compliance departments of these smaller brokers have been doing overtime, stopping their brokers from allowing these or even pursuing these transactions, and and that basically wipes out the basis for the existence of these independent brokers, which is why so many of them are giving up and just either selling themselves or shutting down. John, the TXX Venture is talking about instituting a nexus-type system for directors. Is this a good idea? When I read that, I cringed because I am a nexus pass holder because I travel a fair bit between Canada and the United States. My own experiences with uh, keeping Nexus up to date with my latest passport or driver's license or, or, or alien resident card has been a nightmare with the bureaucrats uh, incorrectly inputting stuff and so on, endlessly getting hauled out of the line to, uh, to be uh, interrogated as to you know why I, my, my Nexus pass doesn't work anymore and so on. Uh, if they're talking about doing something like Nexus uh, simply to make people eligible for directors, um, I, I hope they, they're simply using the wrong metaphor. Could the TXX venture provide more company transparency for investors in a timely manner? And should it also be involved in providing research and analytic products in the, to the investor? Well, I'll address the first question, uh, first. Uh, Kaiser Research Online, uh, part of its business is to assemble information about all the junior resource listings and break them down into what project they have, where it is, what stage it is, uh, how much uh, money the company has, how many shares out and all that. And we provide it in a searchable format uh, that that's actually an enormous time saver for anybody who is interested in this sector. Uh, I've been publishing all these statistics about how many companies have negative working capital, which is about uh, almost 700 of the uh, 1,200 listings on the Venture Exchange owe $2.6 billion, while the other 500 or so have only about $1.6 billion working capital left. Now, why is it that the stock exchange does not know this about its own listings, and why does it not have an online facility such as I've developed that is available at free or at nominal cost so that anybody who's interested in a venture listing can just go there, punch in the company symbol or name, and see all the basic information that they can see on my site. Or if they want companies that have positive working capital and maybe a project in Africa, they can put in all these parameters and get a whole list of it and click on it and do their research. They should have this information internally for their own understanding about what the nature is of their listings and to market themselves to a broad international audience of people, show all the good stuff that is available. So, yes, any initiative that, uh, that goes in that direction is a, good, is a good initiative. Now, as for getting into research and analytics, uh, um, I think the, the most in that area should be providing a search engine so that people can search. The idea of acting like a third-party group such as myself, rendering judgment on their own listings, that implies a conflict of interest. They should stay away from doing that. That is a very bad idea. 
Well, right now, the Venture Exchange is a public shareholded company. They're doing it for money. They're doing it to make a profit. Would the Venture Exchange work better if just the members ran it for on a break-even basis? In, in, in my view, um, part of the problem of it being a for-profit business is that the regulators decided, well, you have a monopoly on the uh, transaction costs. And so to prevent this, uh, mon- this, this monopolistic situation, they said, you must allow other order execution platforms to coexist with the stock exchange's own order order book. And, and the a stock exchange, of course, doesn't like this. Um, but because it, it is a for-profit uh, entity, it had to accept this. And the brokerage industry is required to find the best price for an order, which means they have to take an order and r- analyze what's in all these different order books and then route the order through and you get back these fragmented fills and then reassemble it and present it to the client. This has been the reason also that they've eliminated the uptick rule because when you have something complicated like this happening in real time, you can't guarantee that you're not, uh, say, shorting shorting on a downtick. Uh, in my view, the order execution should be a public good a utility where the goal is to reduce transaction costs as much as possible and have a single order book into which all orders flow and and follow the first come first serve principle which cannot possibly be served with the current fragmented uh, system the excuse we keep hearing about why they can't bring back the uptick rule in canada is that multiple order execution platforms won't allow that to happen. Now, could it be put back in place? The problem with these multiple order execution systems is if you have an order that says, uh, you know, sell, sell say, 100,000 shares down to a, a certain, a certain uh, uh, bid, and this goes into it, and, and the order explores all these different order books which have their bids and asks changing all the time, you cannot guarantee that, especially if you're selling a position short, that uh, that 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 you're not doing it on a downtick because of the changing market. So they 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 cannot have the uptick rule in place for a system where short selling is to be allowed. Germany banned short selling. I don't know how that's really helped their stock exchange, considering everybody's melting down in the first three weeks of the year. But would it be a good idea to bring back the uptick rule and ban shorting? I would never ban shorting. Uh, the problem with the um, uh, uh, issue of uh, of, of the uh, uh, shorting on a venture exchange is that it is very difficult to determine what is the intrinsic value of a company which is a venture to create value down the road. So there is no real basis like looking at the financial statements to see, well, revenue is this, cash flow is that, the the prospects for revenue growth are so and so. So there's a fundamental textbook-based value for the company. So when you can sell short on a downtick, it creates a culture where uh, traders will look at a stock and they'll see some incoming uh, buying activity, and they'll sell short into it. Uh, and then, of course, when that's exhausted, they still have the short position to cover, which they've done it through a special day trading account where you do not have to borrow the stock in advance. And, and what they then can do is continue to sell on a downtick, lean into the order book, and everybody watches the trends in the markets. They watch how the money flows in and the price goes up, and then they watch as the price goes down. And the existing long shareholders who are watching this and are hoping that the uh, the value of the company is now finally going to go up because they just published some good news, they see it starting to go down. And because there's this principle that the chalk marks don't lie, uh, they say, oh, I guess the news is not as good as I thought. So then they turn around and start to sell. And then what happens is the guys who are short they simply sit there and collect back their position, and, and the result is they're stripping capital out of the market, which is real fundamental bets on the outcome of the junior from retail investors, even uh, institutional investors. They strip this out 
and they create a downward bias in the market, which prevents the stock exchange from functioning as a price discovery mechanism. And this is an acute problem for a venture capital market, which, which is why I advocate that this should be a completely separate entity where the uptick rule exists, so this leaning into the, the order book on a downtick uh, cannot happen. An alternative would be simply to eliminate these day trading accounts and force anybody who wants to sell short to have actually borrowed the stock as though they are a true short seller who believes in the fundamental uh, unworthiness of the company and plans to buy back the stock at a lower price down the road when the company's uh, 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 venture has failed or the optimism about its success has diminished. What are market makers, and can they function in a multi-platform environment? That is impossible, because a market maker's job is to assess uh, incoming uh, in incoming supply and uh, provide some support when it isn't coming naturally from from other observers and players in the market, and to also sell sell stock into it when it's uh, when when the stock is rushing up. And, and a market maker selling short would ap- would actually never ever, by definition, violate the uptick rule because they only sell short into strength and then they buy back on weakness. So what their real function is is to enable a stock to be stable within some sort of trading range which reflects the fundamentals and the general activity of uh, of 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 of, of uh, the, um, the 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 market. Uh, having multiple channels through which orders can be put, how is a market maker supposed to figure out when there's a there could be something in the G platform, there could be something in the alpha platform? Uh, you you really need a single order book. You need to see what's stacked up in there. Uh, you don't want to have to read all kinds of these alternative things and even these dark pools where you don't even see what the the activity is of blocks being crossed back and forth. I think uh, trying to formalize market making in a multi uh trading platform scenario is 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 a non-starter. John, you suggest that trading baskets or ETFs are not a great way to do business. Yeah, one the white paper has proposed uh, encouraging the creation of structured products consisting of a basket of various juniors uh, maybe thematically related to some uh, area play or a particular stage of a commodity or, or something like that. Now, these structured products, uh, ETFs, mutual funds, whatever you want to call it, index funds, these are a reason that the Americans introdu- eliminated the uptick rule because the ETF, which is a publicly traded basket, has to have a mechanism by which uh, its value matches that of its constituent stocks. And that means you need to be able to, to to buy and sell the ETF as well as the constituents to capture the you know basically you're hunting for arbitrage for for differences in the in the perfect uh, you know, value that we're, that they should be tracking and you're thereby doing a good thing by by forcing the ETF to have the value of the underlying stocks, which means sometimes you have to sell stock on a downtick that you don't already have even as you're buying this basket. Now, the irony is that for the venture capital market, there are no structured products that are publicly traded that consist of these uh, these juniors. And so eliminating the uptick rule, uh, you know, ignoring the business about the multiple trading platforms, uh, it isn't even relevant to the juniors. Now, creating a, a basket, an ETF basket for the juniors, is going to be tough because they have such poor liquidity right now. You would need this market to become much more robust, much more liquid for the companies that make up these venture listings. The other thing is they are so diverse that I see it hard uh, how to create a, a, a thematically meaningful basket out of these, uh, these, these ventures. What needs to be done so American investors can once again freely invest in the junior markets in Canada? One of the problems that American residents, investors have is being able to get an order executed directly on the TSX Venture Exchange. Uh, and one of the problems is if you have an account at, at Schwab or, or one of the other U.S. discount brokers, uh, you may only be able to buy stock in the parallel pink sheet or OTC bulletin board 
markets where there is poor liquidity and where some market maker is basically arbitraging between what's going on in the Canadian market and what, what they have access to. So, so that, that compounds the liquidity pro- problem by an order of magnitude. There are brokerage firms such as interactive brokers which cater to uh, higher net worth investors who allow you to submit an online order that goes directly into the TSX Venture order book. But again, here the existence of these multiple order execution platforms, this is a nightmare for American brokerage firms because why do they want to be hooked up to this mess of different things when they are required to also get the best order for a customer? Again, if a customer wants to buy 100,000 shares uh, starting at $0.10 cents up to $0.12, cents, uh, that order theoretically needs to explore every single existing order book to fill that so that if there's anything in 11 cents, they snag that before they get to 12 cents. So having this complex multiple order execution system really discourages American brokerage firms from even bothering with the Canadian uh, Canadian listings. And I would think with a, a low Canadian dollar, it, Canadian companies could be very attractive to American investors. Well, the... The, the, the large currency difference is problematic right now. People look at the, at the difference and, and, and they have to worry about the, when, when they do a transaction from their U.S. account that they're going to be hit by the currency spread. And, and so not only do they have the price of the, the junior bouncing all over the map, but they have the currency bouncing all over the map. It was much better when the Canadian dollar was near parity with the U.S. dollar. So, so this is an unfortunate thing that's, you know, Nobody can do anything to improve at the moment. Well, Canada could be like a lot of other countries and just adopt the U.S. dollar as its standard. Yes, yes. In fact, one of my favorite companies, uh, I've told them, why do, Why are you listed on the TSX? Why don't you get a proper listing in a U.S. market? Uh, your revenues are going to be in, in, uh, in, in, in U.S. dollars. Your costs and operation are in Australia. Why is your stock quoted in the Canadian peso? It is absolutely confusing to the audience for this company. Is it time to say goodbye to the accredited investor regulations? I think it definitely is time to do so, especially in light of an initiative taken by the Ontario Securities Commission. Now, just for your listeners' uh, 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 education, the accredited investor exemption says you can do a private placement in a company if you have a net worth of $1 million, not including the equity in your principal real estate, or have made $200,000 a year income for the past two years and have reasonable expectations to see that continue in the current year. In other words, you have to be reasonably well off to be entitled to buy, participate in a private placement. And the supposed thinking behind this is that, uh, that, that uh, because you are wealthy and have, or have high income, you are sophisticated and smart enough uh, to sift through the various high-risk ventures and all that kind of stuff. And the paradox of that is that these people who work for the Securities Commission and so on, who render judgment on, on the companies and all their filings and so on and, and make life difficult for the juniors, uh, very few of them are actually eligible to participate in a private placement, which kind of makes me question, why are they eligible? Why are they being paid... Uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 grand a year to uh, sit there and regulate these companies when, in fact, they're not qualified to participate in private placements on a wealth basis. Now, what the Ontario Securities Commission has done is said, okay, a bunch of these people cheat. They lie about how wealthy they are, and they sneak through on the accredited investor exemption. So they said, now you have to fill out a questionnaire, and it is a very intrusive questionnaire that asks all kinds of information about the nature of your income, the size of your assets, the uh, location of your assets, uh, spouse and yourself. And just about every true accredited investor who has seen this has said, there is no way that I'm filling this out and shipping it off to some junior company whose management the regulators seem to think are latent criminals and expose myself to the high and real risk of identity theft. So the Ontario Securities Commission is not made of stupid people. They know what this is all about. They are creating an obstacle to the accredited investor exemption. So it is time to get rid of this exemption, period, 
and maybe introduce something like uh, expand the uh, existing shareholder uh, exemption that the BC Securities Commission is experimenting with, which has no financial uh, hurdle for you to clear. They simply have this uh, hurdle of, say, you cannot do more than $15,000 in any 12-month period in any in, in one company. You can do it over a whole bunch of companies, which is good for the principle of diversification. The only foolish part about their exemption is that you're supposed to own uh, a share in a company when the financing is announced. And that that's just stupid. If I have some rollback debris in my account from some bad junior that I owned uh, before, why should only I be entitled to participate in a private placement uh, as the company gets its act back together? And somebody else who has never heard of the company but now sees it and understands the promise is forbidden because they didn't lose money in the company in the past. Is there a way for investors with online brokerage accounts to be made aware of and invest in private placements? I think something like this has to be developed, and this is an initiative that TSX Venture Exchange could theoretically pursue. If if the accredited investor restriction is eliminated and some sort of um, limited uh, 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 um, retail investor exemption is created, the companies will be inundated with all these small orders of a thousand, five thousand dollars worth, ten thousand dollars worth. The current private placement mechanism is hideously complicated with all kinds of paper, paperwork. Uh, most of it boilerplate and, and useless, and so on. Um, it, it is almost impractical to open up uh, retail investors to private placements and stick the companies with the responsibility of assembling all the paperwork, checking that it's real collecting the money and then submitting it to the exchange for final approval. Maybe the exchange should build an online system which interfaces with uh, discount brokerage accounts so that when an approved private placement enters the system, it shows up on each uh, client's uh, online interface when they log on to their account, and then they can check it out on their own, decide whether they want it. They can say, put in for $5,000, I have a two-day buyer's regret period, after that, it's 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 uh, committed. It, it's swept out of the account so that the money's already there, and all of this is tabulated by the stock exchange. And when the order book is full, boom, the company is informed. Uh, the certs get electronically transferred into the discount brokerage account. The money gets transferred to the company, and the company's funded. And everybody has their position. They have to wait four months for the hold restriction to end. They'll have warrants up. Uh, along if those were included or the flow-through benefit if it was included. And all of this, whether they're eligible in the right jurisdiction, all that, that can all be established by the stock exchange. It would extraordinarily simplify fundraising for the companies because then they, all they would need to worry about is the merit of the project and the way they've explained what it is that they're going to do with the money. That's probably the most productive thing the stock exchange could do, but we need the regulators to allow retail investors to participate in such a private placement where there is no human intermediary like a broker, which, as I mentioned earlier, the brokers are basically history as far as playing any role in financing the venture capital juniors. With the trouble that Canada's junior markets are in, is there any way for people to join you in trying to uh, fight for a change in regulations and get rid of all this red tape that's choking the market? Well, the biggest thing is to become aware of the issues and understand that this ecosystem is threatened. And they can start by going to my website, kaiserresearch.com, where they'll find a couple links. One is called uh, Killing the Canadian Juniors, which is a a detailed analysis of the four structural problems that are together uh, helping destroy the uh, the junior system. And the other is my cheat sheet, which uh, lists all the, uh, you know, three dozen or so proposed actions and my own little suggestions about why they might not work or how they could be expanded to become more interested and just become aware and become a voice. Go to this town hall meeting, listen to what's being said, speak up, go into the blogosphere and just start making noise so that the bureaucrats in their ivory towers start to understand that the masses are getting upset and ultimately these bureaucrats who work for the government, uh, they are at the mercy of the voters, and the voters can get rid of these people, not directly, but indirectly by standing up and saying, this policy is no good. 
fix it or we will change the government, put somebody in there who will get rid of you guys. And that town hall meeting in Vancouver is Thursday, January 28th, 2.30 in the afternoon at Robson Square. John, how can people find out more about Kaiser Research? Again, go to kaiserresearch.com, the homepage, all kinds of links there. Explore it. Uh, uh, find out about the, the new uh, Kaiser Bottom Fish Edition. 100 new companies launched uh, December 31st. In my view, this is the best ever edition of bottom fish because it's full of real companies, not the shells from past decades. And this is the worst the, the junior sector has ever been. It is such an, a massive amount of managerial talent assembled into a small group of companies at such low valuations that have never been available. It's going to be the, there's never going to be a better one because either in a year or two, this entire system's dead or there will have been a turnaround and this group of companies will have had an astonishing performance such as we'll never probably see again because I doubt we'll see this type of a horrific downturn ever again if they introduce these reforms which allow the Canadian venture capital market to flourish. John, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Jim, thank you for having me on the air. My guest has been John Kaiser, founder of KaiserResearch.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.